Lefuka Island, the administrative center of Tonga's Ha'apai group, is home to a community of 3,000 people. Because of its location near the geologically active Tonga Trench, Lefuka experiences frequent earthquakes. On May 3, 2006, a magnitude 7.9 earthquake caused Lefuka's western coastline to subside by 23 centimeters. Since this event, the island has witnessed significant erosion impacting on houses and key infrastructure located along three kilometers of its foreshore area. Before, they didn't know what is climate change. They liked uh, what the government did for a uh, democrat. The people didn't understand what is democrat. And same thing is the climate change. The people didn't understand what is climate change. Like then uh, the tsunami. They didn't understand what is tsunami. When the tsunami warning, they ran to the sea and watched what isn't happening. Because of this coastal subsidence, Lefuka was chosen to become part of a unique project designed to help other vulnerable Pacific Island communities adapt to rising sea levels. It's very unique in that there, there has been this subsidence, rapid subsidence, which has resulted in the equivalent of rapid sea level rise on that particular island. So we were interested in what the dynamics of shoreline erosion and coastal vulnerability were in association with that rapid sea level rise. And that might be a way for us to get a better understanding of what the future might be in terms of processes under, under current regimes of sea level rise across the region. You know that uh, Lifuka Island is very smooth, there's no mountain, they don't know where to go. That's the main problem in Lifuka. We're on the beach, we're waiting for breakfast. And, um, on 29th September 2009, a magnitude 8.1 earthquake struck the Samoan Islands, generating a tsunami that killed almost 200 people and left more than 3,000 homeless. This same tsunami also struck the Tongan island of Niwa Toputapu, causing nine deaths and destroying 60% of buildings in a community of just 1,000 people. Many families were left homeless and a total of 73 new houses were built further inland as part of the government's reconstruction efforts. The Lifuka project was managed by the government of Tonga with support from the Australian Pacific Adaptation Strategy Assistance Program. The project was designed to help the community to determine the practical actions it can take to adapt to the growing impacts of climate change, such as coastal erosion. It is also hoped that the Lifuka project will help to provide critical lessons for the many remote and vulnerable communities that lie scattered throughout the Pacific Ocean. In many ways, the coastline of Lifuka Island is the coastline of a future Pacific. Whales have always held a special significance for the voyaging peoples of Polynesia. Throughout the South Pacific, many traditional stories and myths depict whales as guardians or even as relatives. Every winter, from July to October, these humpback whales make the long journey from their feeding grounds in the Antarctic to mate and nurse their young in the warm waters of the coast of Lefuka. Today, after nearly being hunted to extinction, Lefuka is one of the few places in the world where people can swim freely with these majestic creatures.
Set aside from the rapidly changing tides of the modern world, the people of Lifuka take great pride in their traditions, their ancestors and their attachment to their land. Lifuka is very special for me. Not only that I was born in Lifuka, that is where I spend most of my life. Not only that, Lifuka I can say, that is the only island in Tonga, in the Kingdom of Tonga as I said, uh, that still have the the respective of, of the Tongan living, like uh, the parents and the children, the respect of the children, the fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters. There is a way of living in Tongan. I know it's only in Lifuka and in Hapai, I think I can say, that they still have that uh, way of Tongan living in life. Yeah, the respective of the families. The Lifuka project took a unique approach by combining scientific surveys of the coastline and groundwater resources together with community surveys and discussions about their coastal problems and the potential solutions. Experts from the Secretariat of the Pacific Community and the Tonga Community Development Trust worked closely with government agencies to involve the community in the collection and analysis of the scientific data. Normally we might go out and do a technical survey and, and actually look at the technical baselines and technical impacts of, of this uh, phenomenon. But now we're able to actually cross over into the social side of this a little bit more as well. So not only look at what the impacts have been, but look look at how the community is perceiving those impacts and what they see as solutions and see how we can integrate all of this together to come up with perhaps not what are just good technical solutions but ones that are going to work in the context of that community, that environment, ones that they can live with for the next 50 years and maintain etc. In the case of Lifuka we found uh, black and white photography, aerial photography dating back to 1968 and then we had a series of uh, five images through uh, four decades uh, to the present day. So we did have uh, some information on, on to, to discern what happened in the past. And it turns out that coastal erosion was actually a problem even before uh, the earthquake and the subsidence. So it looks like uh, uh, parts of the coastline at least have experienced uh, up to uh, 40 meters of erosion in, in the last four decades. A good example of, uh on the coastal erosion is the western side of Lifuka, where the hospital is located. At the time, the sea reached some of the hospital buildings. Uh, and last year, the Ministry of Health uh, built a temporary force. All of uh, those houses uh, on that line, uh, as I know that you've been there in that site, uh, most of those houses uh, uh, were built on the land, eh? but now one quarter or half of those houses stands in the sea. It wasn't just simply a tectonic movement, uh, subsidence that caused the erosion. There seems to have been a lot of uh, uh, development on the coast as well that sort of has interrupted the sediment supply in the past, so the beaches were not as healthy and uh, able to naturally adjust to any, any changes, uh, natural changes that were occurring. Um, so you have so, uh, additional impacts of people uh, sand mining, uh, so taking sand from the beaches for construction purposes or other purposes. I mean, at the moment, there's probably 30% of the population that lives within 120 meters of the shoreline have experienced uh, flooding in a large proportion of those house households uh, experiencing uh, erosion on an annual basis, uh, uh, sorry, flooding of, on an annual basis. And I think um, uh, with climate change or further subsidence, uh, there are going to be more people um, that will need assistance. Further economic analysis was provided to help determine three main options for adapting to future sea level rise and storm surge in the western coastal zone of Lifuka. These three main options were then taken back for consultation with the Tongan government and the local communities in Lefuka. The option one is the sand uh, replenishment. Eh? So one of the problems uh, with the option, as I know, it will uh, have to f following up uh, every three to five years. Eh? And it did budget for, for that. And, uh, if not, I think 
it would be uh, it would end up with the same problem as it is now. Uh, the second option is uh, we have to to move uh, or relocate 100 meters or more than that uh, inland uh, away from the coast and uh, one of the problem with this option is uh, land issues, eh? it's the land issues, uh, because our land is too small and uh, the government reserve is not uh, much left, uh, because most of the land are already owned by the people eh? and it would take time and a lot of uh, work to negotiate with the landowners. The third option is to build a foreshore for protection. From my point of view, uh, this is the best option, not only for protection, but uh, to save our land as it is now. And for the long run, it will last uh, many years. Because we want to preserve our land, not only for us, but for our children and our next generation. Before the project began, the community was strongly in favor of building a seawall to protect their foreshore area. Some initial attempts had already been made to trial a seawall made of sandbags, but this structure was quickly eroded by storm surges. We had the presentation last night and uh, a group has to be split it up and uh, they have to select a leader and they debate on the free option and they all come up at the end with the same answer. Uh, the youth and the women and uh, so is the man. They still prefer the revetment. I guess for them, when they look at the um, uh, revetment, it's a one time all the work is put up for them and they don't have to do anything for the next 30 years. So, and that's the, the thing the revetment advantage the revetment has is just the. They now know it's 30 years for maintenance period. <laughs> Uh, because the one in Tonga has, has been 30 years now and no maintenance at all. Any engineered revetment designed to fix the location of the Lifuka coastline would also have to be a permeable structure. This means that during extreme events it would have to let water pass through in order to break up and absorb the energy of the waves. While such a revetment could protect the land from erosion, it would not prevent inundation unless a very robust and highly expensive coastal defense was constructed. The re revetment that we sized as part of, the, part of this project was for a 100-year return interval storm, so something that has the, the chance, a 1% chance in, of occurring in any one year. So it's, um, uh, so it, it uh, actually ended up being quite a large revetment, so we're talking about uh, 8 meters wide and 4 meters high, and uh, constructing something like that in Lefuka would take, cost a lot of money, so um, you know, we're t looking at uh, more than 5,000 uh, paanga per meter. Um, so for a coastline that needs protecting, you know, a, a several kilometers of coastline is going to be a large, a big expense. The ability of a small rural community to be able to fund the maintenance schedules associated with a large engineered structure, you know, it, it, it's just, it's an impossibility. Because we're talking millions of dollars here. So those sorts of realities, I think, they need to be very clearly explained to the community. So you can take this path, but there will be consequences, and, and, and how do we manage those consequences? Say, well, maybe we don't need such a big revetment, um, maybe we can go for a smaller one to buy us time, uh, and, but what that does is that you are arresting erosion, and you're mitigating against some of those higher frequency events, but it gives people a false sense of security, so I guess what ends up in what we've seen a lot of places is that uh, the foreshore or the coastal areas we see even more development because people think they are protected by this revetment and where in fact um, they're putting uh, their greater risk uh, from, from extreme events. I recall at the beginning they were only saying foreshore because that was the only option that they have seen. It's, it's working especially in Lokalofa. 
they weren't aware of other options. Now the whole process has uh, provided them with other information and other options. And in fact, the discussions was based on com comparative advantages of this option. They weren't just too narrow on uh, focus on, on foreshore. They were considering other options. I'm not uh, really convinced that a donor or external funding um, will uh, be able to provide this, this, this level of funding that's required to build a revetment um, because we're talking about 500 households and 3,000 people. So I think um, the option of planned retreat, in my mind, is still, is still the better option. And I'm, you know, uh, taking into consideration that it will happen not overnight, but over generations. And as people uh, build new, new houses, um, they, uh, they should think very carefully about um, siting it in, in, uh, in areas that are outside of the hazardous area, uh, zones. Here in Hapai, that's one of the issues uh, that facing retreat is the unavailability of land. Uh, not, not saying that it's not impossible. Uh, there may be land out there, but the, the, the government or whoever need to buy it out and then subdivide it and then do the relocation. And then the next question is who, who's paying for the houses? Uh, you're not going to have the same houses you have before, but you know, it may be good to some people. Tevita Sisitoutai and his family had to abandon their home because of the direct impact of the coastal subsidence. They were allocated land 100 meters inland where he built a new home with materials they could afford. Tevita is one of the few people in Lefuka who believes that planned migration inland is the best option for the community. <laughs> Rather than trying to engineer a safe solution in that present location, it's cheaper, it's better, it's ultimately so much better for the well-being of the community and the long-term safety of the community if we can find other areas that are out of harm's way and you have a staged, sensitive, voluntary relocation process. Some of these things, they worry about the length of time that it's going to take for, for uh, negotiations on, on um, settlement with regard to moving in and it's going to take ages. Um, obtaining a piece of land, everybody knows it's not an overnight thing. For them, for sure, is is not only uh, the option, but because it can be, it can be done quickly. They still entertain in their mind the plan migration, but at the same time they want to stop the the retreat of the coastline. So they wanna hold the coastline and then do a plan migration. It may come up with a combination. The information really has to come from government um, to to provide them with the right information on how to construct their houses and, and also incentives on, on relocating them to other locations. So I suppose if the Tongan government were to use uh, resources to um, uh, improve infrastructure away from the coast and at higher elevated positions, then this might be an incentive, incentive for people to, to build in those, those areas. My view uh, is to be patient. I think time is, is a fact because we, we all know that the donor-driven projects are confined to time. 
and uh, and working in communities, as we all understand, is more complicated. They are not standstill uh, stones where we can just come in and work accordingly to our time and our cost. But we have to be patient and more open-minded, especially when it comes to things that are there at that stream. Very difficult for the islands. I mean, uh, that's their farm out there, right? And um, like I said, until it happens to them, then, then, then they'll be more careful and they will start to think twice about moving to the coastline, right? Um, so here in Hapa, it's, it's difficult because nothing has... The last tsunami is only end up on... Uh, just a lift of the waves at the wharf. Not very much of, uh, no damages. So, maybe they need to be reminded in a, in a much bigger way. Well, in rural locations like Lifuka, with limited available land, Pacific Island governments must develop viable and practical solutions that will enable communities to adapt effectively to the changing coastline of a future Pacific. It is clear that no form of seawall can be built to stop the rising tide. Eventually, over time, all communities like Lifuka will be forced to move inland, away from their most hazardous coastal zones. We will simply stop investing our money in those coastal areas because it, it will eventually just not make sense for us. You know, if you know, if you know an area floods all the time, you're not going to build your house there. Why would you invest your money in, in building a house in an area that floods all the time? So you're going to see a gradual movement, irrespective of whether we decide it's a, a smart strategy now or not. Whatever the outcome, the Lifuka project has clearly shown that any solutions must ultimately start and end with the local communities that are most vulnerable to the increasing impacts of rising sea levels. Some of the people, uh, especially all the ages uh, who were born here, who up here, and I think they have knowledge and experience uh, in changing uh, that happen uh, in their lifetime, including nature. Huh? And uh, I think that uh, will be useful and uh, helpful for the scientific analysis. Scientists tend to, you know, look at the ground and, and measure things and not really talk to the people. And, and you just have to find the guy that's been living on the beach for, you know, the last few decades and he'll t tell you, you know, exactly what you, you're probably looking at. And, and so this, this, this local knowledge is often not very well incorporated into studies such as this. So I think in the future we can, we can really uh, learn from this and incorporate the social element with the with the scientific element. For Tevita and his family, the impact of climate change is no longer a question that can be answered at some point in the future. The question of adaptation is now very much a part of their daily struggle to build a better life for today. <laughs> Fing <laughs> 
I think what we have to do is get past this idea that it's just an interesting report for a few people that sits on someone's desk, but it's a tool. It's a tool for that country to use to leverage bilateral support to implement the solutions that they have selected uh, appropriate for their community.